Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Deep Adaptation Q&A for 2021. This is our first. I'm Professor Jem Bendel, and I'll be hosting a different guest every month until the end of the year, where we're going to be exploring this issue of how do people in their professional lives engage with collapse anticipation or deep adaptation, build bridges, make connections, and, and actually perhaps slightly realign their work with that awareness and have interesting and sometimes difficult conversations with colleagues in that process. So today I'm really delighted to get started uh, with uh, our guest today. Uh, Asiya Odugle Kolev is a technical officer at the WHO and I I'll leave it for her. That's the World Health Organization. I'll leave it with her to say what she, she works on. Um, but Asiya is also a member of the holding group of the Deep Adaptation Forum who provide the general oversight, governance and strategy uh, for, for, for that forum. Um, so I'm very pleased that Asiya joins us today. Hello, Asiya. Can you hear me well? Hi, Jim. Yes, I can. And um, it's great to be with you and everyone here. Thank you. And uh, I um, I hope there's not too much background noise. I, um, I'm not in my new, normal office venue. I've had to find a hotel because of some, some internet problems. But we'll see how it, we'll see how it goes. So I think first off, Asiya, could you just um, explain uh, to us what you do at the, the WHO, just some of, some of the basics in terms of your role and the program of work that you do there, so we have that context. Okay, okay Jim, thanks. Um, so I've been working in WHO on and off since 2001. I first joined WHO in 2001 to work on what was then called um, social mobilization and, and how some of the big elimination and eradication programs such as polio and lymphatic filariasis could encourage populations and local communities to take up um, the public health interventions, which were um, around um, um, vaccines, um, uh, um, uh, ivermectin and and, and tablets that could sort of uh, lower the, 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 the viral load of some of the d diseases that were causing um, debilitating um, um, disabilities uh, in some of the poorest nations in the world. Um, and so I then uh, um, moved into emergency response. And again, my focus was on community mobilization and, and how we could work better with communities during emergencies. Um, and right now I'm focused focused on um, how I can take all of those experiences and look at how we can build um, systems, health systems and services that are orientated around people, um, people-centred, um, that can improve the, the, the quality and access to health services. Right, and that, that can sound, un unless you work in this field, that can sound a little bit abstract, some of that, like the, the community engagement. Could you, could you give us an example of what it means in practice today, this sort of the, the, what are you actually working on um, in ways that, you know, we, we might relate to? When I say sure. we, I mean, people from all over <laughs> the world joining here, lots of different cultural and country contexts, but... Yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, we, we, we all have um, our everyday experiences of using our healthcare services. And so, you know, usually we go to our um, family health doctor um, when, when we're sick or when we have um, um, illness. Um, and so when um, the, the, the relationship between um, our, our general practitioner, or when we go into hospital, how we're treated in hospital, um, all of that, that experience is the result of how that health system or service uh, uh, is, has been set up. So the way that um, physicians are trained, um, the way that um, uh, the, the, the teams, the, 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 the nurses and doctors who are uh, providing care at the, at the, at the, at the hospital, um, when, we are, um, uh, when we have epidemics, for example, and, and we have public health officers who come into our homes and sort of ask us about symptoms and how we're, we're, what we're feeling, those are surveillance officers who have been trained 
um, to go and identify what the source of that infection is and then make recommendations as to what kind of um, interventions can prevent sort of that disease from spreading within the, the community. So, so I think it's more broadly, it's at every point at which we as an individual interface with some aspect of the health service whether it's consultation at the local health facility or clinic, whether it's a public health officer coming in to visit us. It's, um, I'm looking at what that experience looks like and how we can enable that experience to shift from um, uh, a telling kind of um, we know best kind of approach to more uh, partnership orientated. So how can we work with, with communities? Um, an example in the way that WHO works, for example, is that um, when I was working with the emergencies program um, during the Ebola response in, in 2014, what we realized was that um, in the three countries that were affected then in Sierra Leone, Guinea and Liberia, there were real tensions between local communities and, and the people that were going in to um, do surveillance, sort of contact tracing. I mean, basically in, in, in what's happening now in, in COVID response, we have people who in the early days were following symptoms and trying to figure out how that disease was spreading and then what people could do to prevent that infection from continuing to spread. So for Ebola, we, 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 we knew how it was spread. Um, and yet it's a disease that causes tremendous amount of fear. Um, and so how the people who are providing that support to local communities um, engage with them, how they're able to build relationships, how they're able to, able to allay concerns, how they're able to understand what people are experiencing and their lived experience of, of trying to manage that um, is, is an area that it's not really taught to health professionals. You know, they're taught in... in uh, um, uh, disease spread and, and um, you know, what to do rather than how to build the kind of relationships that can lead to looking at, well, what's the problem and how can we develop a solution together? Um, and so I was part of uh, uh, a team that, that, that was helping to design and deliver training for staff that were dealing directly with people so that they could learn how to build a different way of engaging with them. Yeah, I was interested when you said of trying to create a different um, approach or even philosophy around partnership rather than perhaps mm -hmm. the old, old idea of extension or outreach so knowing that expertise is in one place and you just need to better get it known about by a community actually switching um because to, to a more partnership approach because i think what i'm remembering is many times i've met people who say then they're not interested in thinking about their health more generally or what they can do it's like because there is a medical profession because there are pills and injections and experts in white coats, people kind of just think, oh, they'll deal with it. And so there's, for some people, this lack of uh, agency, this lack of attention to their own well-being and how what they can do in the community themselves. So, for example, yeah, with, 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 with COVID um, here in Indonesia, but I've also heard about it in the UK, so many people are at work who are sick. Now, they might have flu they might have just a little cold, but they might have something worse. And they're just coming to work in, in various different public facing roles. And I think so much of what's being done, you know, masks and all these other things is like, well, yeah, there's some evidence, but there's a lot of evidence that, you know, if you've got symptoms and you're in an enclosed space, then it may not be COVID, it might be something else. But still, it seems that there's, you can look at that and it's like, well, if people, if, if people thought it through, it'd be like, well, how can we help people stay at home when they've got a fever? Um, you know, that kind of empowerment of people. Um, and it's not just for COVID, it's just for health in general, I guess. But um, so I've been having a few awkward conversations recently with people who are the management. <laughs> it's like, you've got six staff here. Do you want to let them go home? <laughs> but um, is, it, is it a little bit more like that holistic way of thinking? How do you help? 
people understand risk factors and and take action themselves yeah i mean you've 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 sort of raised some some interesting sort of questions around um who is responsible for for the health and well-being um and i i think that that we we all have a responsibility. Some some have more responsibility than others, for example, because of their, their job, their profession, their role, the institution, the mandate that they have. Um, and so I, I think health crosses everything. Health is the business of a person, of uh, a, a business, a community, a hospital. Um, and, and, and I think what's important is what kind of conversations are taking place around what's happening and what we can all do to be able to contribute to my health and your health and our community's health. Um, and, and I think what COVID has done, I think is, has really highlighted um, the, the fact that, that, that it, health is beyond sort of the hospital. Um, I, I, I think it was an idle crisp that, that said uh, uh, cure is, is for hospital, but health is for the home. You know, that, that, that health is, is not only about um, what we do when we are ill, but it's also about the kind of food that we eat. You know, it's about the nutrition. It's about the quality of food. It's about the quality of our environment. It's about the education of um, uh, the way that our children are educated. And, 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 and it's, it's, it's about um, uh, everything related to uh, how health can be a resource for us to live the kind of lives that we would like to live. Um, and, and so it's, it's, it's social, it's political, it's economic. Um, but, but there are some very difficult and essential conversations that need to have around about what, what, how can different pe people and different entities um, address uh, the health needs of, of, of a changing population. Um, I think particularly because we've got um, uh, the biggest issue is, is non-communicable diseases, for example. We know that mental health is a huge problem. We know that depression is rising, anxiety is rising. We know that, uh, um, that people have multiple health problems. For example, my sister is a midwife. And, and when she's working on the delivery ward, it, it, it's not about helping women give birth. It's helping women give birth who may have diabetes or cardiovascular disease. And so um, for her to be able to provide the kind of care, it's, 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 it's become more complex. Um, and particularly when you also look at the conditions in which health workers work, you know, for example, there's chronic um, staff shortages. There are uh, um, the amount of work that health health workers are being asked to do is is huge. It's crippling. We we know that there's you know worldwide there's a shortage of. 18 million health workers in the UK alone. I think there are one in 12 uh, uh, vacant positions at the hospital and, 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 and community level. And so when we don't have enough staff to, pro to provide the care that we need, we don't treat the staff that we have very well so that they're able to work in the conditions that, that enable them to provide the right kind of care. And we're not making the right investments um, to, to shift and transform the way that we've set up our health systems so that, so that the money goes to where it needs, it needs to be, which is primary health care and looking at, the, 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 at community health uh, uh, and, and, and how resources need to be shifted to the places where we can make the biggest difference, which is at the local level. Um, so I think there are plenty of difficult conversations that need to happen in multiple places around what health means and how can we create and build healthier communities um, and workplaces. So would you say you are unusual either in the WHO or the health sector generally for recognizing what I think you've talked about there, it, it sounds like a bit of a crisis in communicable and non-communicable disease and the capabilities and institutions and the staff at the moment to help address those would you say would you say it's a crisis is that a good characterization and and are people aware of, of it in your sector 
I think people are aware. I mean, if, if you look at um, the reports that come out of WHO, if you look at the reports that national governments are making around the state of, of um, healthcare, people recognize what the problems are. And we're very good at um, describing problems. But, I mean, th that, that's what we've been trained in. We've been trying to identify problems. I think where the difficulty is, is in the solutions. And, and it's the solutions which challenge us because no one sector or no one discipline has, has the answer. It, it, it takes a collective response. Um, so for example, when we look at um, the area that I work in, which is community building, um, I am unusual in the sense that I really look at community building and community engagement as a mechanism that can help us um, really look at, at the connection of what people do and who people are in the in institutions in, in, in which they, they work in. And so, and so, for example, you know, if you look at the definition of community engagement from WHO, it, it talks about you know, community engagement as a process of, of developing and building relationships. But what do we mean by relationships? <laughs> when, when we look at, at, at the evidence around community engagement and the literature, um, it doesn't say anything about the quality of relationships. You know, how do we measure uh, uh, the relational dynamics between people? Um, how do we look at sort of, how do we see lived experience as being evidence? You know, evidence is not just numbers and, and measuring disease. It's about what are the experiences that, that people uh, um, experience and how does that impact their own sort of uh, uh, um, um, uh, health and well-being. So, for example, one of the things that I argue is that, you know, people may see community engagement as being a bit woo-woo and wishy-washy. It's about, you know, tree hugging and people holding hands and singing kumbaya around, you know, a tree. Um, but if we look at the, the, the science that's emerging, we know that if we want to understand how people connect and engage, we really have to look at the connection between um, our brains and our central nervous system, our relationships, um, and 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 our minds. And so there are there are people and groups who are really looking at approaches that combine knowledge. Um, and, and, and I think we, we, we have to draw upon uh, um, the, the, the power that diversity in knowledge has to enable us to understand how we as human beings um, um, relate to each other and, and, and can collaborate better. Yeah. Thank you for that, that, that good summary. And it's really good to hear that that kind of insight is, is within, it's not just, just yourself, it's also recognized recognizing the role that you have within you know the UN World Health Organization and having those conversations. So you're also on the holding group of the Deep Adaptation Forum and many of the people who are joining us today do so because they are working in that, that field in some way, a field which anticipates increasing societal disruption and even collapse and perhaps not, not so far away into the future. And so it's... um. I'm really interested now that we've got a sense of the work you do, what interests you in, um, in deep adaptation, about deep adaptation, but also um, where, where the connections can be made between a, this sort of focus on communities and its relationship between communities and, and the health sector, um, and this idea of, yeah, more disruption um, to our way of life everywhere. Um, so it's a huge topic. I know it's one that you're exploring at the moment, but any any initial thoughts? Um, <laughs> I mean, when, when, when I was first introduced to deep adaptation and, 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 and the work of, of people in the deep adaptation uh, movement, um, I mean, I was first taken away by the enormous amount of activism that's there um, and the enormous amount of commitment and drive and the desire to reimagine a different kind of future because the way that we are treating um, our planet at the moment 
um, could lead us to what some people will consider the, the sixth, sixth extinction. extinction. Um, and that something has to change. Um, I, I think where I began to draw some um, parallels was that deep adaptation is um, it's inner work. You know, it's 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 the belief systems that we have about who we are, our place in the world, um, how we work together. Um, determines um, what we create. And, and, and I think the biggest realization that, that I had was that, you know, if we want to change the future, we actually have to start changing ourselves. And that means looking at the connection between our inner self and the outer expression of who we are, which is comes out in sort of the behaviors and how we treat each other and what we think is, 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 is important. Um, recognizing that, 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 I mean, society has changed. I mean, I remember when I was growing up um, uh, that, that my sense of, of community was very different to a sense of community now. Um, I'm certainly not living in the same location as, as, as my parents were, were living, for example. Um, I feel much more isolated and, and, and there's that sense that, that there isn't a community or a group of people around me that can provide the kind of social networks and support that I need to be able to uh, uh, um, deal with the challenges that, that I face. Um, and, and so what's that sort of social support system that's in place? What does it look like? And, and we can't take it for granted. I mean, I think we have to begin to recreate it. <laughs> we, 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 there was a survey that, that, that was done that looked at, that asked people the question, where is their biggest source of resilience? And they said, my relationships. What's your biggest source of anxiety? My relationships. <laughs> and, and, and so there's something that we have to look at as to what is it about our relationships that, that we need to address that can help us begin to maybe renegotiate what kind of, 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 of makeup of our social networks need to be in place to help us raise our children, educate our children, evolve as people, contribute to society. Um, and it's that relational piece that I think and that adaptation that's required to shift and do the inner work that that, that that really struck me. Really interesting to hear. So just for, for context, um, so you're now in Geneva and that the way you're living there at the moment, there's not the kind of community engagement and support um, relationships of the quality of your parents. Where, where were your parents? My father died. Um, my mother lives in um, Somaliland. I have brothers and sisters in the UK. Um, so we're spread over. I see. So and that's really interesting that you, yeah, you've, you've noticed the, because yeah, for the first two years of the Deep Adaptation Forum, it's been very much focused on what people are calling the inner work and the ways that we show up open-hearted, open-minded, curious, creative, like uh, we're in an unprecedented situation. The emotions are high. Um, it's all quite scary. Uh, we can't apply our old models and we also I think probably generally have a feeling that if we try and get a quick fix it's it's kind of like running away from the problem rather than staying present to it's difficult how difficult it is um so yeah because of that the focus has been on modalities for how how to be in dialogue in in pairs or in groups um now some people think wow that's a little bit like blah blah can you not, you know, there's, 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 there's a world that's crashing around us, the sixth mass extinction, as you say, as well as rising poverty and starvation and all sorts. Um, and it's, it's an interesting one because I also think that the, the quality of ideas and the depth of commitment people have to those ideas that come out of these al alternative ways of relating and dialoguing yeah, is, 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 is something that would not have happened if we just had a quick, quick meeting, like, uh, where's the, 
where's the quick thing that we can do that we all feel confident about throw some money at it so um so yeah for the first two years very much so um the inner work but i also as you said right at the start there's a real strong activist vibe in the um in the deep adaptation movement and that happens both with the volunteers in the forum and people starting all kinds of initiatives locally but also a lot of people are very committed to climate activism as well you know the more standard trying to cut carbon or draw down carbon and the deep adaptation stuff is just a complement for that for them so um i'm i'm definitely been very inspired by all the people who've got involved you wanted to come back on something i said to see you is that right yeah yeah i mean i i, I just wanted and I, I just saw a comment in um uh, from andrew saying that the DAF added values on the inner work and and I, I really think that um, we have to take inner work into our public sector organizations um, and I think the um, by public sector organizations I mean um, our, our health systems our education systems our judiciary systems our <clears throat> agriculture systems and, and and the reason I say this is because I mean, somebody once said that, you know, our, our first relational schools was, was our, is our family. And, and in that first experience of, of, of family and community actually um, sets up the um, neural architecture and the algorithms for how we navigate our life and how we navigate our relationships when we're adults. And so I think we have to recognize that if our... Uh, lived experiences of being in family and in community are changing as children, then that will change, uh, that will impact how we as adults also navigate our relationships with my adults. Um, so, for example, um, we know that uh, one of the key issues that, that we need to address is, is trauma and impact of, of, of trauma um of on 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 children and trauma is not an accident that happens um it can be parental neglect it can be uh um, bullying at school it can be a whole range of things but we know that our experiences as children set us up to how we're going to become ill or in in later life um and at the moment we we have medicalized our responses to people who have addiction problems, for example, or people who um, have difficulties in, in, in dealing with life because of that early, early, early childhood trauma. Um, I mean, there's just so much information out there. And, and the work of Gabor Mate, for example, um, who's a Canadian physician, um, is, is, is someone whose work that I find fascinating because he 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 makes the argument that that um, we really have to look at, at, at uh, addiction and some of the behaviors that people have in coping with life as as a relief of suffering. And so our health responses has to change from penalizing them to looking at how a a different kind of response can can help them. Uh, uh, um, um, deal with the, the the suffering that they faced in in early life. I mean, we know that 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 childhood trauma can can uh, ha, has a a seven hundred percent increase in, for example, uh, people becoming alcoholics. Um, it, it increases um, uh, people's uh, suicide attempts, and so I think there are areas. Yeah. around relationships that I think we, mm. we, 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 we can focus on. And I think the organization, yeah. the organizational cultures and bringing health and well-being into our public sector organizations is, 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 is a way to address this. If we don't address it, then we will continue to have organizations that don't know how to mm -hmm. partner mm -hmm. because the very people in them don't know what it right. is that is driving their, their 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 values and their behaviors so physicians heal thyself absolutely <laughs> um, it's uh yeah i absolutely i am um, it makes such a difference the way people are with you if if you've got some ill health i mean whether people actually care about who you are um and and don't sort of have this sort of starting assumption that any of the deeper stuff that might be going on is just somehow 
uh, shameful, but actually is hidden treasure. Like, uh, yeah, it might be psych psychosomatic. Let's delve into that and let's explore your healing and mine together. I don't, I don't get that vibe from um, my GPs of the past. Mm. And um, yeah, and it's very much turning to alternative communities like the Mankind Project, men's group, all sorts that have really helped me explore um, what may have been going on deeply in me that has created addictive behaviors like workaholism being my, my favorite drug of choice, which uh, once a, always recovering, yeah, was it never, never recovered. So we're going to, see. we're going to go to some questions now. And we're going to have a question from Tamsin and then a question from Andrew. How do you see deep adaptation alongside clinical health work? Does it fit in there? How, I mean, how, do, how are you then tackling it Thank in you. your role at WA? Thank you. That, that, that's a really good question, Tamsin. Um, and I think there'll be the, I, I sometimes think I'm crazy doing this work and staying inside WHO. Um, but how I've approached it is that uh, you can tell people information until it comes out of their ears. People have to experience it. They, they, they actually have to go through an experience of what difference what you're talking about means. And so, for, for example, um, I, I've been drawing upon sort of the, the work of, of, of several um, uh, Interdis interdisciplinary scientists and so uh, I don't know if you've come across the work of Daniel Siegel and um, the work that he's been doing in, in developing a framework called interpersonal neurobiology um, and so I think with clinicians and with scientists you've got to talk their language and you've got to sort of uh, look at helping them um, understand uh, and illuminate things that are invisible to them you know, that, 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 that they've been taught sort of how to do their clinical work, but it's not only what they know, it is um, who they are as they are doing their clinical work. And it's the relationship, which is a healing relationship. And so, for example, there's been a number of studies that have shown that um, the influenza vaccine is much more effective when you put people in a good mood. So, so you know, it's not only about uh, the vaccine itself, but it is how people feel as they're receiving the vaccine that, that, that makes the vaccine work better um, or not. And, and this speaks to the fact that as human beings, we actually produce our own chemicals. <laughs> you know, we produce hormones and chemicals. And so if we are in relaxed, open states, we are flooded with hormones and chemicals that are different to when we are in stress and fearful states. And so this is sort of the, the, the mind body connection. And I think there's clinicians need education. And this is where I think um, functional medicine is, is important, that medicine is not sort of, you don't just look at the problem. If you have uh, a knee problem, it's not just the knee, it's the person to which the knee is attached it's 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 the social uh, it's a family it's, it's the experience and so broadening uh, um, uh, people's understanding of the interconnectedness between how we feel how we think and and uh, the places in which we live in um, is, is going to be really really important and, and I think as Jem said physicians heal thyself I think when we care for our physicians. I mean, there are some studies that show that in US and Europe, over 50% are experiencing depression and a sense of failure. So, so if, if they don't feel that they are in a position to, to, to do what they came into the profession to do, then there's a problem in how they then deliver care to people. Thanks, Asiya. Um, Andrew, um, over, over to you. And then afterwards, Faye. Hello, everybody. Hello, Isaiah. Um, first thing which I'll take offline is uh, we should obviously meet because I'm working in UN in Geneva and I focus on French states and things like that. So I've given you my email in chat. Um, I'm interested from the perspective of practitioner's mind state, um, as you know, I'm in a new environment. And uh, so our practitioners work on sustainability and saving the planet, et cetera, et cetera. 
and uh, climate science. And um, so I'm keeping close track on uh, both my own mental state on that and watching everybody else. We have a bit of an underground network starting in terms of not quite DAF UN underground, but basically the people who get it and no longer, so to speak, uh, unblinkingly read the messages, etc. Now, my, my question is, what's it like in WHO? Is there much of a psych uh, there? How are people adapting to it or talking about it or not talking about it at management and at peer level? And uh, any tools or tactics being being uh, employed? Very interested in following up on this later as well. Thanks. Brilliant question, Thank Andrew. You. It's uh, it's such a toughie. Uh, I used to work at the UN. I have no idea how I would be bringing this this conversation within within the UN system at the moment. So yeah, any um, any thoughts on anything Andrew's asked there? Yeah, nice to meet you, Andrew. And, and yes, we'll, we'll definitely follow up. Um, I mean, I think um, pe people change organisations. And, and I think one of the key lessons I've learned from my own life is that, you know, we are all work in progress, you know, and, and, and the best way to impact and influence others is to model and embody that which you want to see. You know, and, and, and so, I mean, I've, I've sort of um, uh, look at, 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 at who I am in relationship to my colleagues. And, and so, you know, we know that ministries of health and WHO is a reflection of ministries of health is, is uh, still highly uh, medicalized, although that's, that's changing. Um, it's, 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 it can be bureaucratic, it's hierarchical. Um, and so how do you begin to build relationships and, and, and get people to sort of look at the parts of, of, of the organization that we don't normally talk about? And that's feelings, that's emotions, that's our relationships. And, and I can see that Cecilia is, is, is amongst us. And so Cecilia and I are um, part of a, a group of activists that, that were started many years ago by our assistant director general at, at the time um, to really try and change and shift the culture of, of, of our organization. And so one of the things that we did was interview our own staff about their lived experiences of, of professional relationships. And we spoke to people. And there were some heartbreaking stories about how, you know, when we focus on what we do, not on how we show up and who we are, we are inadvertently creating ill health and anxiety and stress and not seeing it. You know, I remember when I first joined WHO and, and I was in a meeting and somebody stood up and said, I don't care if I don't like anyone, you know, it's about getting the job done. <laughs> and you kind of wonder, well, if you don't like the person, what is that going to convey to them? Um, and, and science has now shown us that, that there is emotional contagion, you know, that, that how I feel about you gets communicated, even though I don't tell you that and I'm trying to mask the fact that I don't like you. Um, there's an intimate connection between our relationships and our brains and how our brains function. And, and, and I think um, we've been kind of bringing in that science and bringing in lived experiences data and talking to people. Um, and we've written a report about it. We went to our director general and said, look, <laughs> This is how we need to be changing. This is what people are saying about their relationships. They, they recognize it needs to change. They're not happy with it. We need to create a culture where there's more collaboration and caring and kindness and concern. But it's everybody's business to do that. And that there is also people who are in who are responsible for teams and people who are responsible for organizational policies, and they need to do something about it too. Um, and so, Andrew, to ask your question, I, I think change comes from the inside as well as the outside. And it takes courage, I think. Um, and, and it takes, as, as somebody once said to me who was working quality improvement in, in, in one, of the, one of the countries, it's about gathering together people who care about a certain issue and then slowly working together to address it, 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 it collectively. Yeah, really interesting. I'm hearing you answer Andrew there I'm 
I'm wondering when we talk about inner or outer work, it could be misleading because I'm hearing very much about relational work. Like it's, it's not just inner, it's, 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 it's how we relate um, in organizational life and therefore also how some of the assumptions about what is professionalism uh, are, are really unhelpful uh, for us to be honest with each other about the nature of the predicament. Um, Andrew, I see you've just commented in the chat box as well, this yawning gulf between the aspirational stories of the UN based on the original charter and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and all the various conventions and treaties, and including then and up to the Sustainable Development Goals, the whole 17 super aspirational ones, and then, and then all the indicators that are looking really terrible at the moment in the opposite direction that gulf and um yeah it's are we allowed to show up at work and cry and <laughs> how many people do that um it's not about crying jen i mean seriously it's not about it's being able to self-regulate your emotional states so that you're not being reactive you know i mean we as we go about our daily business you know, as, as, as we talk with colleagues, it's about noticing what's happening inside yourself and, and, and knowing what triggers you and recognizing when those triggers are yourself and when those triggers are outside. It's a dance. It, it is a relational dance. And, and it's always paying constant attention to what is going inside of you, what is going between you and others. And if you're responsible for organizing meetings, for example, how can you design meetings so that everyone's voices is heard? I mean, how can you bring into, into uh, uh, your meetings decision-making processes that is not about just because I'm the boss, I, I tell you what you should be doing. It, you know, it's about creating interdependent professional relationships um, and 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 and, it, and I think some of the the the, the interventions um, the organisation needs to bring in to create a different kind of culture, because I think one of the things that we also do within the UN is confuse process with procedure. <laughs> you know, people will say it's not about the process; we have to get the results. But how can you get to quality results if you don't look at how you design your processes to make sure that you work in ways that draw upon the people that you need, uh, the data that you need, make sense of it so that you are you are you're co-developing, you're partnering, you're collaborating together. That's skill and that's competence. It's not just about crying about stuff. Not just. Didn't say only cry at work. <laughs> Sorry, you triggered something in me there, Jen. Jen okay, but I we could laugh, could laugh, say. laugh too. Uh, and yeah, and even I, I don't know, maybe not get angry. Yeah, interesting. So, um, Faye, you have a question for Asia. I do. Thank you, um, Asia. I, given the the focus on deep adaptation on social cohesion, I'm interested in your views on how health can be a, a force for social cohesion, um, particularly where communities are you know, displaced or conflict affected. Um, uh, can we better integrate social cohesion into health system strengthening? And apologies for the, the kind of more sort of um, sector specific language there, because I also work in, in this field. Thanks. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the research on social cohesion um, is 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 there i mean we we know that if we have good quality relationships if we have a social support system we live longer um we uh, um, are able to manage our anxieties we uh, you know stress goes down we we know that that where where relationships work and social networks exist um, we have a very different experience. Um, and, and I think health has to be a driver for change. Um, I mean, health and well-being is fundamentally at the heart of human development. You know, if, 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 if you, we don't take care of, uh, uh, of, 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 of our health, then it has all kinds of, of consequences. I mean, COVID is just one example where you know, health issues result in, in 
interventions and lockdowns that affect people's ability to work, people's ability to travel, which is huge economic consequences. Um, but how we create health and maintain well-being is a fundamental question that I think we, we need to be asking. And we need to be asking this question across sectors and between sectors. There's, there's, there's a, a lot of sort of recommendations about working across sectors, but, but what is it that we're trying to change and how can we have those, those, those conversations? Um, I mean, I, I think that there's lots of uh, projects and in, in, initiatives, for example, um, uh, there's one I recently came across um, called Connecting to Communities, for example, and there's one quote that, that, that stood up that, that said from the community, you know, if we wanted a unicorn, we said we would have wanted a unicorn, you know, but we want a dentist, you know, um, and, and so part of it is how do we listen to what communities actually need and how do we then change ourselves to be able to deliver for the kind of services and address the kind of issues that people need. They may need housing. They may need, um, you know, rubbish to be taken out of the, the housing estate. They may need, um, it's about listening. And, and, and I think one of the biggest complaints that we have is that communities say that health services don't listen to us. And one of the biggest complaints we have from health workers is that our management and our leadership don't listen to us. So even if we build in listening as a capability in itself, that could be transformative too. Yeah, I see. I, I, that's, that's really clear. And I know having chatted to you in the past, that is something you're very passionate about and leading on within, within the WHO. Um, and so I, I hope more people in the UN system get to see this video um, and, and share it with colleagues. And perhaps we'll see more such uh, attitudes and initiatives across the not just the UN system, but intergovernmental sector more generally and beyond. As we've come to the end, I just want to check, is there something that you really feel you'd like to emphasize that you haven't shared or do you feel uh, complete on this topic for now? I never feel complete on this topic, Jen. <laughs> <laughs> right. And I, I think it's so important, um, this, this understanding of relationality um, that... I believe relational competence is something that is so important to how we are able to build the kind of families, communities, organizations that can help us to thrive. Um, and, and as relationships shift, I mean, even the relationships between men and women, for example, that's, that's a huge area in, in itself. Um, it's really bringing in an understanding of what we mean by the con connectedness that we have between each other. How does it work? And understanding that, that knowledge, how can we use that to build different kinds of relational dynamics that can help us thrive in all of Thank our you. different kinds of relationships? Thank you. And uh, it's amazing seeing some of the people who are working on related topics in the UN or in health that are sharing in the chat. So everyone, we're coming to the end now. So please put your emails in the chat so you can connect with each other. Also, if you're interested in this, uh, what we've talked about and sharing it with colleagues, then uh, just type Jen Bandel into YouTube and you'll arrive at my YouTube channel and uh, do leave it a couple of days and then this video will be there. I'll also blog it on my blog, Jen Bandel. Dot com. Uh, and also in the notes to the YouTube video, there'll be links to various relevant things that have been mentioned by ASEA or by people who've, who've questioned or mentioned things in the chat box. So um, if you're interested also in next month's conversation and beyond, then um, the easiest thing to do is to look out for it either on the positive so it's now just called Deep Adaptation, the Deep Adaptation Facebook group or the Deep Adaptation Ning, which you can get to through deepadaptation.info or just uh, type Deep Adaptation into LinkedIn and you'll also find the Deep Adaptation Leadership group and this, this will be an event. The next one will be an event there as well. So those are the easy ways for you to find out the next. So Asiya, thank you very much for joining us today and getting this uh, conversation series started this year. 
You're welcome. Thank you for inviting me, Jim. Yeah, and good luck with all the work you're doing both within the UN system, but also in support of the, the Deep Adaptation Forum. It's brilliant that you're on board and bringing your international ideas and insights and and understanding of how the intergovernmental sector works. I'm learning too, Jim. So thank you. <laughs> We're all learning together. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye-bye.